What do hurricane winds and your weight have in common? In this video, we'll find out. Thanks to Brilliant.org for sponsoring this video. If you've taken physics to high school level, you'll know there is a difference between mass and weight. Mass is measured in kilos, or pounds if you're from the 19th century, while weight is measured in newtons. Now, we confuse those two all the time because in everyday speech, when we ask a question like how much do you weigh, we often give an answer like how bloody dare you, instead of something like 800 newtons. We do this because a person's weight and a person's mass are in the same direct proportion everywhere on Earth. Weight is a force, which means to calculate it we can use Newton's second law, F equals ma, where the force, your weight, equals your mass, in kilos, multiplied by the force of the Earth's gravity, which isn't actually a force, it's an acceleration. Man, we are really bad at calling things by the right name. In case that's confusing, think about it like this. If you were to jump out of a plane and ignore air resistance, then you would start accelerating and falling faster and faster at the rate of the Earth's gravity, which, if you're an engineer, is 10 meters per second squared. So after one second, you'd be falling at 10 meters per second. After two seconds, you'd be falling at 20 meters per second, and so on. That means that to calculate a person's weight, we can just multiply their mass in kilos by 10 meters per second squared, the acceleration due to gravity, to get their weight. So if you have a mass of 80 kilos, that means you have a weight of 800 newtons. But if the acceleration due to gravity is the same everywhere, it just makes sense to keep the numbers small to talk about kilos instead of newtons. Fortunately, however, not all of us are engineers. Some of us are physicists. That's worse. That means we know that the acceleration due to the Earth's gravity isn't actually 10 meters per second squared, it's closer to 9.81, but also that it isn't the same everywhere. In fact, the closer you get to the equator, the Earth's gravity gets weaker. So even though you would have a constant mass, as you get closer to the equator, your weight would decrease because the acceleration that's acting on you has decreased. This happens because the Earth isn't stationary, it's spinning on its axis. And just like the circular motion of a merry-go-round, the rotation of the Earth provides a centri fugal acceleration, which increases the further out from the axis of rotation you are. The acceleration is given by the formula v squared over r, where v is the velocity and r is the radius of motion. It acts to try and fling you off the Earth, but because the Earth isn't spinning very quickly, it's not a very big acceleration. If you're near the Earth's poles, then you're not far from the axis of rotation, which means that you don't experience much of this centrifugal effect. Well, if you're near the equator, you experience a lot of it. And because this acceleration acts outwards away from the Earth, while the force of gravity acts inwards towards the Earth, that means your mass is acted on by a net smaller acceleration, and so you weigh less. How much less? Well, Earth's surface gravity at sea level varies from around 9.78 to around 9.83 meters per second squared. It also varies a bit with altitude. So we're talking a variation of about half a percent. And that has actually been compounded by the fact that the Earth's rotation causes it to bulge at the equator. The Earth's not a sphere, it's technically an oblate spheroid. What that means is that at the equator, there's a greater distance between you and the Earth's center of mass than there is at the poles. And so because gravity is acting over a greater distance, it means that the gravitational acceleration is weaker. But it gets stranger still, because as well as weighing less the closer you get to the equator, you weigh less the faster you travel east. This was discovered at the turn of the 20th century, when a series of research ships from the Institute of Geodesy in Potsdam, which I can only assume is one hell of a party school, were performing experiments across the world's oceans on the strength of the Earth's gravity. Back home, analysing their data was a Hungarian physicist named Baron Roland von Erdbusch, and he noticed that as well as the Earth's gravity being weaker the closer that the ships got to the equator, the gravity they measured was weaker when they were travelling east and stronger when they were traveling west, consistently across all their measurements. You can actually see this really clearly in this one graph from a repeat experiment in 1908. Originally, the science ship is moving slowly westward, then quickly westward, then reverses direction and moves slowly eastward. Overall, the ship experiences a change in gravity of around a hundredth of a percent. Erdbusch cleverly identified that this effect was also because of the Earth's rotation, but 
in a more subtle way. When we're thinking about motion on the Earth's surface, such as how gravity works, we have to remember that our coordinates are fixed relative to the Earth's surface, so latitude, longitude, height, but that the Earth is also rotating. What that means is that we're working in a non-inertial reference frame. And it's called that because we are experiencing on the surface an acceleration when seen in a reference frame that's exterior to the Earth, such as the reference frame of the solar system. What that means is that we have to make some corrections to the equations of motion that we use to for example, calculate local gravity. What I want to do is take you through this derivation because it's really quite simple, but I think really quite cool. And at the end of it, there's a connection between two bits of physics that you wouldn't expect. Let's say that you're on the surface of the Earth and have some north-south velocity, lowercase v, and an east-west velocity, u. That would mean that you're engaging in circular motion around two different axes. Your north-south velocity, v, is effectively moving you in a circle with a radius the same as the Earth's, which we can call r. Your east-west velocity, u, however, is taking you in a circle whose radius depends on your latitude. Its radius is r times the cosine of your latitude. When you're at the equator, latitude 0, its radius is going to be r, while if you're at the pole, latitude 90, its radius is 0. That means then that by moving along these two circles, you're also creating some new centrifugal accelerations, radially outwards in the case of your north-south velocity, and along the east-west axis, but still outwards, in the case of your east-west velocity. Except your velocity in the east-west direction isn't only your own, because remember, the planet is rotating. So while your centrifugal acceleration radially outwards is given by the normal formula, that's v squared over r, your centrifugal acceleration in the east-west plane is given by a more complicated formula. It's your total velocity squared over the radius of motion. So that means u, plus the velocity you have because of the planet's rotation, all squared, divided by r times the cosine of latitude. We'll write u sub p for the planetary velocity for now. Remember though, we're interested in the extra centrifugal acceleration that you experience because you're moving. So we need to subtract the centrifugal acceleration that a stationary object would experience anyway, just from the rotation of the Earth. But that's easy to do, we can use the same formula and just set the local velocity u to zero. Expanding out this bracket then, two of these terms cancel, so we're left with just the one square term and this cross term. So these are the two extra centrifugal accelerations you create by moving around on the surface of the rotating Earth. But we're interested in the effect this has on your weight, which means the effect that they have on the acceleration you experience radially, as that's the direction gravity acts in towards the centre of the Earth. To calculate this is a simple bit of geometry. We already have one component of acceleration acting radially, v squared over r, and one which is inclined at an angle to it. A little bit of trigonometry shows that this angle is none other than your latitude. And so the final change in gravity experienced because of your velocity is given by this formula, where we've multiplied the second acceleration by the cosine of latitude. We can make this look a lot nicer by substituting in the equation for u sub p, which comes from circular motion around your latitude, and writing your total velocity, as calculated by Pythagoras, as capital V. We're left with this nifty little expression, which has two components. The second component is basically the centrifugal acceleration you need to create in order to remain on the Earth's curved surface. Well, the first term is more interesting. The first term is effectively the Coriolis effect. Just as poleward motion is horizontally deflected by the Earth's rotation, east-west motion is vertically deflected. So your local gravity is deflected in much the same way that the winds that form a hurricane are. And compare this expression to the Coriolis parameter, which we use in meteorology for that purpose. Though not by as much. If you were to travel due east at 20 meters per second, which is 72 kilometers per hour at 50 north, which is London, then you would experience a decrease in local gravity of 0 0.0029 meters per second squared. Or equivalently, if you have a mass of 80 kilos, you would weigh 0.23 
newtons less. Which is still really cool. So perhaps the takeaway from this is that if you want to lose weight, then people are right to advise that you go running. Just to maximize your results, make sure you head east. Fast. If you enjoyed the derivation in this video, then you almost certainly like learning about cool bits of maths and physics through worked examples. And if that's you, then oh boy, do I have an announcement for you. Introducing Brilliant.org! That's right, it's a whole website of maths and science problems! They're interactive! They're beautifully illustrated! They're expertly written! I can't keep up that intensity. <laughs> The derivation we did in this video involved both gravitational physics and also rotating reference frames in classical mechanics. And wouldn't you know it, Brilliant has expertly written modules on both of these topics. So if you'd like to explore more about how the Earth rotating causes some unusual physics, then you can learn through solving problems and testing yourself. It's honestly the single best way to learn. Having said that, I've long wanted to brush up on my iron oxide chemistry, so I will be checking out their new chemistry course. If you'd like to join me, then head on over to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, and the first 200 subscribers to do so will get 20% off their premium annual subscription. Or if you want, you could buy a subscription for a friend or a loved one, perhaps even an engineer, so they could learn some proper science. Thank you for watching this video. I made it because of a chance discovery I made on Reddit. So that took me down a neat little rabbit hole of planetary dynamics, which I hope you found interesting too. If you did find it interesting, if you learned something, then pop it a like, give it a share to people you might find interesting, and uh, you can always subscribe to this channel if you want to see more of this kind of thing. I guess that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.